Welcome to worship. In our worship today, we hear the story of a Samaritan woman at the well, and we also consider the life of another March saint. Our call to worship is based on Psalm 95. O oh, come, let us sing to our God. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into God's presence with thanksgiving, singing joyful songs with praise. Our God is great, sovereign above all powers and principalities. The sea, the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains, indeed all of creation, were made by God and belong to God. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Holy One, our Maker. Yes, God is our God and we are God's people. Oh, that today we would listen for the Lord's voice. Today, O oh Holy One, we re rededicate our hearts to you and strain our ears to hear your voice. Speak now, still speaking God, for your people are listening. Waiting at the Well how often have I come here, Jesus, to this place of old faith and fresh neediness, bent down with the burden of my failures, stumbling in my thirsting for hopefulness, the cracked vessel of my heart leaking grief. How often have I come here not expecting you in the heat of my pressures, not expecting you in the stress of my confusion, yet meeting you, you who offers water to the helpless, who quenches our raw thirst for acceptance, who gives the deep sustenance of kindness without payment, the nourishment of love without limit. How often have you met me, Jesus, refilling my heart, leaving me astonished again in the depths of my being that you waited here for me, even me. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, bearer of God's grace and truth, we come into your presence today to worship you. We bring all of ourselves to you, all of the good, the bad and the ugly. We entrust our hidden, fearful and fragile selves to your transforming power and gentle, loving care. Blessing, glory and honour are yours alone. Thank you for the many ways your spirit breaks into our lives and into this troubled world. We know that we so often ignore your presence in our lives in so many ways. And so we now offer to you our prayers, acknowledging our mistakes and neglects. Caring Jesus, you love us, but we do not always love you. You call, but we have not always listened. We walk away from neighbours in need, wrapped up in our own concerns. We have gone along with evil, with pride, quarrelling and divisiveness. Lord of mercy, hear the prayers of your thirsting people. For every time we have attributed your miracles in our lives to our own hands alone, forgive us, we pray. For every time we promised to trust you, but turned to our own way when your response did not come soon enough or in the way we expected, grant us mercy, O Lord. For the many opportunities to extend forgiveness that we have refused, show us what it means to love again, O God. For each way we put our own understandings above your wisdom, for each time we resist your command to be reconciled with those who believe differently from us, direct us in the way of peace, we pray. For our silent sins, our quiet acts of violence, and our indifference to the suffering around us, forgive us, O loving one. Because of great, God's great love for us, we have peace with God and access to God's grace. Therefore, we may ask of the Christ to give us the living water that revives our spirits and fortifies our souls. We have heard the good news. We know we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And now we pray together in the words Jesus Christ taught his disciples while on earth, saying, Our Father, who is in heaven, 
holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us in the time of trial and deliver us from evil for use us the kingdom, the power and the glory now and forevermore. Amen. Exodus chapter 17 verses 1 to 7. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of Sin, travelling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at the Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarrelled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses replied, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the law to the test? But the people there were thirsty, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, Go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the place Massah and Meribah because the Israelites quarrelled, and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? (laughs) Gospel according to John, chapter 4, verses 5 to 30 and 39 to 42. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sichar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, Give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, the time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. 
We worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and his worshippers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me <clears throat> everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the saviour of the world. I'm going to talk today about three people, two of them we heard about in our Bible readings, and the third is someone who lived centuries later. Our three characters are Moses, the Samaritan woman at the well, and St. Patrick. Let's start with Moses. The life story of Moses is in the section of the Hebrew scriptures that is prehistory, a collection of stories written in the 6th and 5th centuries BCE, long after they were meant to have happened, to give the Israelite nation, a people in exile, a backstory, a feeling for where they came from, a feeling of being significant to some higher force. The story of God producing water for the thirsty Israelites occurs three times in Moses' life. First, just after the Israelites leave Egypt, God shows Moses how to make bitter, undrinkable water fine for drinking. Second, today's story of the striking of the rock set within the first month of their journey beginning, and third, right at the end of Moses' life, when he again strikes a rock to make water come. Moses' story is full of him forever having to deal with his grumbling people. In today's story, Moses and his brother Anne, having inspired the Israelites to leave Egypt only weeks ago with the promise of heading to the Promised Land, Canaan now find themselves travelling south through the desert of Zin, a place near to Mount Sinai, towards the bottom of the Sinai Peninsula, certainly not the most direct route to the land of Canaan. The direct route would have taken two and a half days. But a route perhaps dictated by hostile tribes in the Dacian areas, and also being justified in the story as a means of God testing the people to see if they truly believed that God knew best. The fact that it took the Israelites 40 years to cover the 250 miles from Egypt to Canaan is extraordinary and can only be put down to terrible navigational skills, a dodgy sat-nav, or perhaps <coughs> a reluctance on the part of the people to truly believe that God would be on their side when it came to fighting all the neighbouring tribes en route. Anyway, here we are weeks in and the people have run out of water. A reasonable cause for complaint, one would think. And God, having previously been petitioned to start providing manna to stop them starving, perhaps the people felt that with a bit of a grumble at Moses and God, the necessary water would be provided. I'm sure all of us have experienced life with a whining child or a whining adult, someone who will just not accept what's happening and move on. Someone who finds fault is never happy, likes to complain. Moses has been travelling around the desert with what seems to him like one million whining children. The people are never happy. They are now back to thinking that slavery in Egypt was great, which it certainly wasn't, and blaming Moses for all that's not quite what they expected. When he was the leader taking them to freedom, he was a great guy. Now that they've run out of water, he's not such a great guy after all. 
Moses is fed up with their fair weather support. After all, he's only their leader because God, God told him to get on with it. And so he immediately deflects their concerns to God. Don't shout at me, he says. God has got you here. Are you going to shout at him? Why do you quarrel with me? Why are you testing the Lord? Do we look to our community and national leaders as folk we can complain about when things go wrong? And yet how involved are we in local and national decision-making agencies, the community council, committees organising the local folk bank, food bank, community events, our church life? Do we engage with our leaders or just moan that they're terrible? Do we happily let other folk run things, then complain when stuff goes wrong? Moses hasn't sought this leadership position. The whole point of his story is that God appointed him to this work. And so he asked God what to do, and he and God sought the problem out. Maybe Moses did wish that God would make the people's path to Cana a little smoother, but he trusted in God to provide when troubles landed. The Red Sea had parted, the manna had fallen, surely water would appear too. Moses tells God what's going on, God gives Moses his instructions, and the people have water once more. All is good till the next disaster. What does this story offer us today? For me, it's a reminder that we all have responsibility for how our communal lives pan out. No one is an island. Better to light a candle in the darkness rather than just curse the dark. We can't absolve ourselves from responsibility by blaming others. Especially in these troubled times, this story serves as a reminder that our individual actions do certainly make a difference. That we need to be looking out for the vulnerable in our communities more than ever. On to our second character of the day, the Samaritan woman at the well, forever nameless because the male writers of the Gospel of John didn't think she was important enough. Even though that's one of the points of this episode in Jesus' life. Our story starts with Jesus tired, hungry and thirsty, resting by a well while his disciples go foraging for food and drink. A woman appears and completely unchaperoned, Jesus has a conversation with her. And it turns out she's not just any woman, but a Samaritan woman, part of an ethnic group who dislike the Jewish people as much as the Jewish people dislike them. Much like the divide between the Roman Catholics and Protestants in the 20th century, Samaritans and Jews worshipped the same God, but theological differences over the centuries developed into a mistrust and dislike of each other. At the start of the story, Jesus and his disciples have strayed onto Samaritan land, probably to avoid conflict with the Jewish temple authorities, who are becoming a bit too interested in his teaching. But Jesus and co wouldn't necessarily be welcome in Samaria. And finding themselves with no food or drink, the disciples go off to see if they can persuade anyone to give them something. Jesus sits alone at the well. Until the woman appears and the rules of hospitality in Jesus' time dictate that if she sees a stranger at the well with no means of getting herself a drink, she must offer one. Down through the centuries, the Samaritan woman has often been described <coughs> as a shameless hussy, a woman who kept getting rid of husbands, a woman who came to the well at midday because then she wouldn't have to be ignored by all the other villagers who would go when it was cooler in the morning. But nowhere in the story is that suggested. First, the husbands. Assuming that not all the women's husbands have died, that would be really bad luck, although I do know a couple of folk who have had two husbands die on them. It would not be up to her whether she stayed married or not. Under Jewish and Roman law, the men, either male relatives before marriage or husbands once married, decided who she married and whether she stayed married or not. And then the fact that she's living with someone doesn't mean she's choosing not to marry them. Under Roman law, a couple couldn't marry if they were of a different class. So if she was rich and her partner poor, or vice versa, they were forbidden to marry. And why would folk have originally married her and then wanted to get rid of her? One of the commentaries I read suggests that she was attractive, good to look at, and men wanted her because of that, but were perhaps unaware that she was a woman who knew her own mind. And that wasn't so great when she was meant to be obedient to them in the home. From the discussion she has with Jesus, we see that she was well informed about theology, able to hold her own in a debate and interested in what her sparring partner had to say. Somehow, Jesus knew about her marital status, but he isn't shaming her, just getting her attention, drawing her into his story. Second, the idea, idea of social ostracisation. 
The woman comes to the well on her own, therefore she must not be accepted by the rest of the village. Again, it doesn't say this in the text. We don't know where the well is in relation to her house. Maybe she lives really near, saw Jesus approach the well and was intrigued. Maybe she just popped out for a bit of water. We're told that she runs into the village and everyone listens to what she says about Jesus and asks to hear more. Surely she would need to be of some social standing before folk took her word seriously. And for the first and second century hearers of this story, the single woman coming to the well at midday for water would remind them of the Genesis story of Rebecca coming to the well and meeting Isaac, Abraham's son. The writer of the Gospel of John is tying Old Testament stories into their Gospel, encouraging their listeners to see Jesus' life as part of the continuing work of God. When the disciples return, they find Jesus buzzing from his encounter and a warm welcome awaiting them in the Samaritan village. Jesus' lack of fear of the stranger and that stranger's willingness to engage has meant that his good news has spread beyond the confines of Israel. That even before his death, Jesus' message of God's love for all is being evidenced. Living, never-ending water. That's what's on offer in this story from Jesus' life. That and the knowledge that Jesus is interested in everyone and isn't afraid of breaking social conventions to tell about God's love. No matter where we are, Jesus can be there with us. And so to Patrick, whose Saint Day's, Saints Day is celebrated in Ireland and around the world this week coming. Patrick, brought up in a Christian home who shunned Christianity, had no interest in attending church. Patrick, who was captured by slave traders and taken from his home in Wales to Ireland, where he was made to work as a shepherd. Patrick, who during those six years spent mostly on his own up the hills, came to know and love Jesus Christ. Patrick escaped from his slavery and made it back to Wales, where he started studying the Bible and eventually became a priest in the church. And in a neat squaring of the circle, once trained, Patrick went back to Ireland, not as a slave now, but as a bishop. And he travelled around Ireland, telling Jesus' gospel of good news. Patrick's story is one of Jesus finding us where we are, Having ignored Jesus throughout his childhood, it was while he was an isolated slave shepherd that Patrick had the time and the space to listen for and hear Jesus' voice. How his family must have rejoiced when he returned home unexpectedly, well and praising God. Although Patrick became an important figure in the establishing of the Irish church, he seems to have kept that close relationship he established with Jesus while on the hills tending the sheep. His prayers reflect how he believed and treasured Jesus being with him wherever he went. Here's a version of what is known as St Patrick's Breastplate, his prayer for the day that would keep him going no matter what. I arise today through God's strength to pilot me, God's might to uphold me, God's wisdom to guide me, God's eye to see before me, God's ear to hear me, God's word to speak for me, God's hand to guard me, God's way to lie before me, God's shield to protect me, God's host to secure me, against snares of devils, against temptations and vices, against inclinations of nature, against everyone who shall wish me ill, afar and anear, alone and in a crowd. Christ be with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ where I lie, Christ where I sit, Christ where I arise, Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in the eye of everyone that sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me. Salvation is of the Lord, salvation is of the Christ. May your salvation, O Lord, be ever with us. Amen.
Let our, us place our trust in God as we offer our prayers for the needs of the world around us. Let us pray. Holy God, whose spirit moved over the waters at the dawn of creation, hear our prayers for all who thirst today. We pray for those who are spiritually thirsty, who long to know your presence but don't know where to find you. We pray for those who are alone and without hope, those who long to feel needed and loved, those who are searching for meaning and purpose. O healing river, pour down your waters and heal your people. We pray for all who are physically thirsty, who don't have enough water to drink or feed their animals, whose fields are parched, whose crops have withered, those who have to walk long distances to find enough water to survive, or who have to be content with water that is unclean. We pray for those whose homes and villages are torn apart because of drought or famine. We remember the people of East Africa, of Ethiopia, Kenya, Somalia and Somaliland, and the people of drought-stricken Central America, those living in Guatemala, Nicaragua, El Salvador and the Honduras, who have suffered again and again from terrible drought over the last few years. O healing river, pour down your waters and heal your people. We pray for those who are thirsty for justice, who long for an equal sharing of resources among peoples and nations, those who put their lives at risk to protect streams and rivers and oceans, those who are working to find clean water and make it available to those who need it. O healing river, pour down your waters and heal your people. God, we ask that you would open our hearts to the needs of all who thirst. Give us courage to work together for justice, to stand alongside those who are thirsty, so that all people everywhere may live without want or fear and may discover the abundant life you promise to each one. In the name of Jesus Christ, the source of living water, we pray. God, your grace reaches out to all of us. You call us to live as citizens of heaven, working together with one heart and mind. Strengthen us to live in a manner worthy of the good news we have received, offering our lives in service of your realm, where the last are first and the first are last, and there is grace enough for all. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Lord. Amen. Once again, it's been a privilege to share worship with you. This week, may we remember that God is a great provider and may we too be generous with our time and talents that they may be used to restore hope and wholeness to those in need around us. And now a blessing. Life is short and we do not have too much time to gladden the hearts of those who walk with us. So may we be ready to love and unhesitating in offering kindness. And may the blessing of the deep mystery we name God, source of life, love and hope, word of life and ever-present spirit of grace, be with us this day, this week and forevermore. Amen. Amen.